my little interdimensional travelers to Walk the Watch Now! Where we talk about what's streaming on Netflix right now! And in today's episode, we are talking about the highly anticipated VOA Season 2. Uh, the first season came out three years ago. But today's episode is special for multiple reasons. Not only because um, I've just been dying for this to come out and I'm so pumped about it, but today is my 100th episode! Woo! I'm, I'm shaking my hands, you can't say it. Woo! <laughs> I can't believe I did 100 episodes. Um, it kind of snuck up on me. I didn't actually really notice until I saw the number was at like 90. And... Uh, well, I guess I have concrete proof that I really love talking about this shit, so uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone or anyone who took the time to listen to even but one of my episodes, and especially to the people in the last, you know, month that have gone out of their way to say and write really nice things. Uh, it, it meant the world to me just to have conversations with you guys, because I really do mean it when I say you can talk to me on Twitter um, about theories and stuff. I love talking to people at length about this shit. And uh, just, like, the compliments were... I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It, was, it made me feel good, you know? So, yeah. that's I'm just putting that out there. Um, I might start a, a Patreon. Uh, it, if it's in the description, I made one. Uh, just because, like, you know... You never know. And so if you feel like donating and you like the show too and you want to help support it, feel free to throw a dollar my way, you know, whatever. But either way, guys, uh, I just really, really appreciate it and that's all I have to say on the subject. <laughs> Anyways, okay. The OA Season 2 is super dense, but I have a method to the madness. I've broken it down where I'm going to talk about uh, the different storylines, give you, you know, set them up for you. Then I'm going to talk about how they connect. I will go over the ending with all the spoilers included as usual. And then I'm going to talk about my whole lot of questions. I have so many questions, theories, predictions. Some of it's just food for thought, but above anything else, I would love to hear your opinion or what you think on the matter. So I have my Twitter in the description below. And as I said in the beginning, I love talking to you guys. So feel free to throw out your theories and such um, as I go over these questions. Now, season one and season two are radically different. While the OA season one was a beautiful cry session, spirit quest, season two is a hyper stress inducing, hypnotic, jaw dropping puzzle. Uh, like, I was curious if you needed to watch season one to see season two the way they were kind of set it up, setting it up in the trailer. Definitely go watch season one. I think you would still. No, it's so wackadoo. You probably still need to understand a lot of it by watching season one. Plus, a lot of the emotional hard hitting won't land if you don't understand what they went up against. It would just kind of seem like fodder. Like, it just kind of goes in the background. It doesn't mean as much to you. But the first season, you'll cry. You'll feel very enlightened. You feel like you figured out something. It will all seem like this dread was for something. And it's really beautiful. Season two, I would say the first two episodes, I was having a heart attack and wondering if I could even get through it because it is taking all the really intense parts of season one and amplifying it to 11. But then that being said, all of the puzzle part of it, you know, I went into season two kind of anticipating the puzzle. Um, I kind of understood how Brit and Zal, who uh, created it, Zal Batmanjil and Brit Marling, in the first uh, episode, you should definitely go check that out, that I covered on season one. I talked about their background in history uh, with how they go about storytelling. They truly are masters of storytelling. Uh, they created it, and they also wrote it along many other writers. One of the other dominant writers was Dominic Orlando. I just want to point him out because he was in 10 episodes. But, or he wrote 10 episodes with them. You can try as you might when it comes to this to think, to predict stuff, try to see how it interlocks. But even in the end, I got most of it wrong. Like, I was truly blown away as things would get unveiled or surprises would happen. Even when I saw bits in the trailer that you think would be hinting to certain things, I was still blown away. So I, I have to say that while I am going to be going over this series, just like I said with the first one, this truly is the type of series that 
me giving away spoilers is not going to take away when things get unveiled and how crazy everything interconnects. I promise you, your mind will be blown several times because um, Brit and Zal truly give a shit about what they're putting out there. And when you realize little insignificant moments that then stand out from the season one that just seemed kind of like weird moments that didn't get answered, you kind of even forget about them. When they get answered in season two, little weird moments in season two make you wonder what will happen in the third season because they're totally going to have a third season at this point. Uh, but I wanted to before I go into anything, just take a cute moment and talk about how much Brit and Zhao love each other and love working together. Um, this is a cute little Instagram post Brit put up. She wrote, I've been telling stories with Zhao one way or another since we met when I was 18. At first, we just told each other stories back and forth in our dorm rooms, later our living rooms, and much, much later, our writer's room on the OA. I am every day inspired by the Brit Britith of his imagination, the depth of his soul, and the tenor of his mind. That only becomes more true with every year we keep trying to get better at storytelling together. The OA is a labor of love that begins with how much I love him, extends from us to our entire remarkable cast and crew. And it just kind of goes on to thank some other people. So, like, so sweet. Okay, the OA season two has a lot of plot lines going on. In season one, I would say the bulk of it was about OA meeting some a uh, group of people, the guys. I'm going to call them the guys. I'm from Jersey, so, like, we say guys. <laughs> the guys, but that includes Betty, the woman, the teacher. Um, the guys, her group, coming together and listening to her story of her past, of how she got kidnapped, and her previous uh, life when she was a child before she got adopted and everything, kind of her spiritual quest and how the stories all kind of come together. But season two, I felt overwhelmed at the idea of trying to tackle this because there is so much. Okay, so here are the, I would say, like, four main storylines. One, there's a house on a hill with a rose stained glass. It was designed by a couple without any children. I don't know why they kept pointing that out different times, I guess. <laughs> A woman who was a medium and her husband who was an engineer. This is a magical place over a special stream. And they considered themselves almost like the gatekeepers. So this house exists, this magical house, so to speak. It's very mysterious. It's almost like a giant puzzle itself. Two, a detective, a new character introduced, Kareem. He's hired by an older Vietnamese woman who asks if he will come find her daughter. And what starts off as just kind of like a unfortunate missing case situation, she could have been in something bad, or maybe she just unfortunately was kidnapped, something like that, ends up becoming a whole lot more mysterious with a weird online game that is causing people to throw themselves out of a window, trying to protect its secrets. Then there's plot point number three. OA has successfully jumped into another life. So remember how they made it seem like with their certain near-death experiences they would have these kind of like visions? At first everyone thought it was visions into like heaven, like they were going to finally die and go to heaven because they kept coming back alive in this lifetime. They were unable to pass through. So this this movement she did with her group Hap also did with the remaining members. He threatened them. He put them with these uh, certain type of shots. So he's like, if you don't do these movements with me, we're all going to die in this field in 11 minutes. So do you want to pass with me or not? These five uh, particular movements they took all season to figure out and learn. Uh, she, instead of jumping to quote-unquote heaven, ends up jumping into an alternate version of herself where she never ended up having that incident as a child that caused her to be blind and then her dad died and she got adopted, all that jazz. She actually got, in this lifetime, a lot more time with her dad. She still has her Russian accent. Her name is Nina. She coincidentally is in a relationship with the mysterious gentleman Ruskin who was the inventor of the very app that could be the cause of why Kareem's, uh, the woman he's trying to find, the young girl, why she was missing. So 
weird, mysterious, right? But we're not at uh, the connecting yet. Um, Hap and the others did successfully jump. But for whatever reason, Homer didn't jump. So, like, Homer in this alternate existence is mentors under Hap, who became a psychologist, a successful psychologist. So, Darkly, the other members are still under his imprisonment. He has control over them. But he's fully aware that he is Hap. Um, And he kind of manipulates Homer to his advantage. Because in this world, Homer doesn't know these other people. And he really admires who uh, Hap had become or whatever. Plot point number four. Thankfully, they did not get rid of the group. The guys and Betty, the people who are listening in the first season to the OA story. Unfortunately, though, they are still back in the original timeline. So they are grieving the loss of their friend. They are, you know, I think there's a bit of survivor's guilt uh, surviving the shooting. While everyone does consider them heroes, they're definitely going through a lot of emotional grief. And there's a part of them that wants to band together, but they're not quite sure what or why. And honestly, at this point, uh, some of them are even wondering if OA's stories were real or if anything they did was real. They're just kind of like going through a giant life crisis, to be honest with you. Um, I will say, though, Steven is still super committed to the cause. I feel so... Ah! Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What the fuck was that? Oh my god. Okay, I'm just gonna leave this in. Holy shit. I'm sorry if I hurt your ears. I definitely saw something run across my feet. <laughs> Let me just put it this way. I don't think it was an animal. Holy shit, that just scared the fucking shit out of me. Okay, well, we're going with this, guys. <laughs> Does anyone remember the ghost piano from The Big Lebowski? I don't know what the hell this is, but you're not welcomed. <laughs> you're not... I'm good. <laughs> Anyways. Jesus Christ, that scared me. Uh, what was I talking about? Okay, so they're... they're, <laughs> they're back to the OA. Uh, the, the group is kind of falling apart, and they get pulled back together with this kind of spirit quest so to speak which is kind of interesting because everyone's going through a spirit quest you're not special group (laughs) and what ends up happening is one night buck keep going she's going to move like two days later which i thought it was pretty fucked up of her mom to uh, like the solution is to pull her away from all her friends i thought that was pretty fucked up but anyways one night she looks into her mirror because she hears a vibration Part of me wondered if she stuck her hand through that mirror, she could potentially go through it. That was like another form or way to travel through the line. Because later in the series, we see a vision in the TV of a woman sticking her hand through the mirror. So part of me wondered that. She sees Rachel, and she's great about her, like she recognizes, she feels it's Rachel, one of Owe's friends that successfully transferred over to the timeline. And she's singing this tune, and she's calling to Buck. And this uh, rare, weird moment leads them to go on a journey to find this mirror, try to contact Rachel. And just honestly, they feel like they're meant to be somewhere and go check something out. And ultimately, by the end of the um, series, it's beautiful how they all join up, because one of the big things that happens is oh wait i'm jumping ahead we we'll, we we'll, we we're, we're, we're going to get we're going to get to that so now let's talk about how they all connect which is kind of crazy so we'll start off with oa uh she does successfully jump but when she jumps she ends up having kind of like a heart attack in the process or her person does it seems like a heart attack to everyone because of the transition to go into someone else's body it you know Uh, She gets brought into the hospital, but unfortunately she isn't concerned about appearing crazy because she believes her truth is so real and she's not afraid to hide. She's almost got a naive innocence to her in that way. So she sounds like a crazy person and they want to basically put her into an asylum. Another unfortunate thing, though, is when her boyfriend, like I said, Pierre Ruskin, the creator of this mysterious app, I think it was called Symphony Q, uh... She doesn't want to see him because she doesn't know who she is. What she fucks up, though, is that he was her way to get out. When she goes to this asylum, 
unfortunately, it's not just your run-of-the-mill place. You check in, you go there for 14 days, you kind of mellow out, they check you out, and then you go on your day, especially if you're supposedly sane. You know, she could maybe fake it for 14 days. Unfortunately, it's the exact same asylum, Hap is at, so she is back to being a prisoner. This is why you will have an intense emotional um, freak out for a good two episodes seeing this repetition. To be honest with you, this is one of the weaker points of the show for me. I know some people will disagree because it is so pivotal, her relationship with Hap and the motivation and everything. And there's certain points of it I don't mind, but I find the type of claustrophobic feeling of being tortured in that way extremely unwatchable. A good example for me is the governor from The Walking Dead. Uh, that whole plot line, especially when he assaulted Maggie and was doing a lot of fear plotting and fear mongering and, and tricking, um, I can't remember, remember the blonde girls, uh, the blonde girl who didn't realize he was evil, he was making it seem like he was good to her and then evil to everyone else, like, that shit is tiring, so it seems like it's going to be the whole series, we're going to have almost a repeat of season one, but in a different cage, but thankfully, OA gets out. Now, OA is kind of on a quest of, like, why isn't Homer back in his body? And also, I'd like to change timelines, please. <laughs> uh, this is not what I want. I want to get my friends out of here. We want to keep moving on. Clearly, we need to keep moving on. This isn't the right timeline. I don't even know if she's fully aware at that point of her plan or goal. Like, I want to be like, oh, wait, do you see the world as um, something like, are there levels and you have to climb each level before you get to the ultimate destination? Do you think that you just accidentally missed the mark. On the other hand, we have Hap, who is going on a journey to figure out how can he not only control Nina, aka OA, because he feels like they have some deranged partnership. We get more of an insight that he's clearly in some weird way in love with her, and he's truly crazy because he thinks that they have something to share and discuss, and I'm like, dude, you're you're trying to own her and imprison her. How on earth, it's weird, it's like you do want her to have the freedom to say whatever she does, but you want her to free, willingly pick you. And honey, have you not seen the damage? And he does what a lot of abusers do in any regards, and I'm referring to a wide range of abusers, that they always say, oh, well, that's the past, get over it. And it's like, the past for you? <laughs> you got over it real quick, you didn't go through any of this shit. I would love them to go into a timeline where Hap's the prisoner, that'd be beautiful. Uh, so that's what Hap's going through, and the others are trying to get their story out there and figure out how to move. Now let's discuss the bigger plot point that connects the other storylines together in a very confusing, um, it's not that confusing when you explain it kind of way, but let's try to break it down the best we can. So Pierre Ruskin, who barely has a part in this season, uh, he wasn't in season one, yet he feels so significant, it almost makes me wonder if he'll show up in season three in some way. Anyways. He's a very successful guy, and one of his businesses is secretive. He's a secret business. And the secret business, he pays people to dream and record their dreams. This is really weird, right? Like, what's the point of dreams with all this? Well, apparently he's doing this based on a thesis written, a book. And in the book, there is documentation of people dreaming with certain images that line up with proof that World War II was going to happen. So this is before World War II would happen. It kind of shows that maybe dreams are some sort of gateway. There maybe is either a predictive element about them or something of some significance. So he's clearly looking for something. It kind of makes you wonder if he's used this method to help him get, you know, have advantages in life and be so successful. Because a lot of people describe his... Um, mind-blowing inventions, you know, as almost like able to uh, come up with something before it's in anticipate people's needs. That's the way to put it. So when he's uh, having these people dream, over time there is three reoccurring images. A tunnel the size of a coffin, a double-sided staircase, and a rose glass stained window. Coincidentally, this place with these three factors exists the special house I told you about. I'm just going to call it special house because I keep tripping over my words. <laughs> so the special house on the hill. Now, what he did was he created an app. This app leads people to uh, break down really complex, weird, obscure puzzles. And these puzzles 
are leading to a bigger answer. It almost feels like when you see the model in on the kitchen table that they're clearly they are remnants of um, the t- the way to travel the whole stream that OA talks about when it comes to interdimensionally traveling and just what it's like to spiritually experience things, but through math and geometry. But as people solve these riddles, they eventually get to a point where they figure out they uh, need to go to this house. That this house, when you initially enter it, isn't what it seems. As it's described by one character, you have not truly been in that house. You know, there's like a way to get deeper into it. And, you know, if you're not responding in an outlandish, like, holy shit kind of way, you haven't really seen that house. Interestingly enough, the Vietnamese girl that had gone missing that Kareem was trying to find, she was at the house. So she was doing that puzzle. She went in there. There's even evidence later revealed that she got to that stained glass window, that she saw something she might not have She shouldn't have seen, so to speak. We get a crazy reveal, by the way, that that girl is actually Buck. It's great because when they show her picture, they show it from far enough away and you just don't recognize her or him with longer hair as a girl because uh, he's transgender. So that's like a great little bait and switch reveal. And apparently he isn't um, waking up or she in this timeline, she's not waking up because of whatever she saw in the stained glass window. And it turns out it was actually a trick by Pierre Ruskin and the older woman. He's like, you tricked me. You said she was missing. And he says, this girl, this is not my Michelle that went missing. Which is interesting. It's like, what do you mean she's not your Michelle that went missing? Right? We we know. We know a little bit about that whole time jump thing that potentially, somehow, Buck is already almost in this timeline in a weird way. Or maybe it's a different version of Buck. Who knows? Either way, she's in a comatose type state. Pierre ends up revealing to him that those three images that lead to the house, well, there was actually four. He wasn't told about the fourth one, but there's four. And he says there's always a face seen in everyone's dreams. And he had he flew out all the best uh, sketch artists to recreate this. And all the faces came out the same. And it turns out it's his face. It's Kareem's face. So somehow Kareem is meant to go in that house and you don't know why. So it's very weird, very almost Twilight sci-fi because you're like, what the fuck is with this house? At one point, uh, when Oa and him meet together, they both go into the house together. And on one hand, Kareem experiences something totally different. He experiences people crawling out of dirt and trying to kill him and attack him. Clearly many people have, quote-unquote, not been worthy and have been taken down by the house. It's almost like Monster House (laughs) 2. And then O.A., on the other hand, went into the earth and talked to the trees and had some sort of beautiful spiritual connection. We learned that her going into Nina's body was not a coincidence. Nina was a medium and able to connect, her ability was able to connect to natural forms like animals, like when she talks to Old Knight, the giant octopus. Yes, giant octopus, you heard me correctly. You have to watch it, it's so amazing. Um, the giant octopus, and she can talk to the trees, and all those moments when she describes like the wind almost talking to her, it turns out the wind was talking to her. So she's getting this special message. This house is kind of like a crazy weird vortex to the river she talks about uh, passing through. Um, This is also important, by the way, because remember when I mentioned Kareem showing up in people's dreams, what's his significance? Well, at one point we get told by a character or quote-unquote messenger, another interdimensional traveler that is not part of the group. Apparently you can travel all you want, back and forth, who cares if you're good enough? And they explain that uh, O.A. always, or she, so to speak, always sends her brother, which is very weird and ominous. And we'll get into that with the whole question part of it. So Kareem is like her spiritual brother, and they are meant to go on this journey together. Now you might say, well, what's the purpose of the house? And okay, I get get it, they're connected, and I get O.A. searching, but... What are they going to get out of all of this jazz? Well, this is where it gets really interesting. At some point, there's a side moment when Oe realizes she's been repressing Nina, the human, and she needs to connect to her to better express herself. 
We get an interesting showdown where she goes back to talk to Hap, which is crazy. And she almost, uh, it, it's, it's like, why would you walk into this? But she goes in there to talk to him and point out that he most likely has repressed his own situation inside of him. He too probably is jealous. Maybe they're not so unalike. And she ends up getting shown to him because he thinks that she quote unquote gets it. She's finally his partner. This secret experiment that he's had in the basement that Rachel, may I add, died for. I just want to point that out. Rachel died. And that's when Buck was able to see her. I also want to point out when Homer was talking to French, that whole incident and everything like that, that whole face scene thing, Homer at this point hasn't returned yet to this new body, this new timeline. So I'm just putting that out there so it's you're kind of like in awareness of this. She ends up seeing that the people that she knew in her previous lifetime, her group members, they have somehow weirdly, he doesn't oh he doesn't know that OA knows these people in another lifetime. He's collected them, he's done experiments on them. He's used the house, him and Pierre Ruskin, to find candidates if they can pass through the house to use as weird spiritual flower experimental gardens. There's literally weeds and flowers growing out of their orifices, and it's so sad and disgusting how he's using them as, like, literal vegetables. It's disgusting. He's just using these special angels on a whole nother disgusting experimental level. I mean, it's, it's gross. And we get this great moment when she stands up to him. She makes a really great point that I think to, is so important to know to understand what being an OA or specifically an angel means, which is... She talks about the idea of it's important we're in each other's lives because someone told her this. And she's like, it's important that we're in each other's lives because I am meant to be crushed until I am a diamond. Because all you have is your terror and your controlling ways. And I have power. And she actually chases him down. It's kind of a cool reverse power moment. This is why I say... I hate the whole hap OA dynamic, but these are moments that make it worth it and have the payoff. Unfortunately, he um, shoots Homer right as Homer gets his memory back. <sighs> Isn't that how it always is? And uh, at the same time, she ends up having a moment where uh, she, he's put her in a position where he's like, we're going to go to this other timeline. I've eaten a piece of this flower from this decomposing human. This allows me to kind of control where we're going to go. And we're going to go to a place where you won't even believe you're OA. And we're married and we're together and I'm a control freak. Ah! (laughs) And she accepts, okay, we're going to this timeline together. I'm taking Homer with me. And when we do, I know ultimately we'll find our way back together. She's starting to have kind of more faith than ever. It's quite a beautiful moment. So Kareem, at this very exact time, is going through the house himself again, and he makes his way up to the rose-stained glass window with this kind of epiphany has. Part of me wonders if the epiphany allowed him to get to the top. And he opens up the window, and you wonder what he's, what everyone's seeing on the other side. What is this other thing they are seeing? And he opens up the window. At the same time that they are traveling or about to travel, this moment's happening, the members of the group, have made their way to the exact same location that the psychology or what I guess you would call it asylum or whatever is. And they are in the exact place that she is and they are doing the movements. And what seemed like they weren't real or insignificant enables them to, I think, give OA this amazing power. It kind of shows you how like fate and everything kind of comes together. And OA straight up fucking glows and rises up into the sky with amazing, beautiful power, like the amazing person she is. And at that exact moment that they're doing this and giving her that extra power, I'd like to think, you know, it kind of all beautifully came together. At that exact moment, Kareem opens a window, he sees her. Somehow this this window enables him to see her. And it kind of is this beautiful awakening moment where he realizes all everything she said was real. All of this was real. She, I don't know what he was thinking at a certain point. I don't know if he thought it was real or not, but he thought there was too many coincidences, too much of a mystery. He couldn't not look into it. So he's seeing this beautiful moment. Everything's connecting. It seems like everything's on their side. And unfortunately, by some freak accident, fate, I don't know, this, that's what this whole show is about. A pigeon flies through this weird warp time hole. 
It distracts and scares OA. She drops from the ground. What happens is they do successfully jump, and now this is when we get fucking meta. This is the ending. We talked about how everything interconnects. This is the crazy fucking ending. Kareem looks down the window, and it's a set. The set of the same place that OA, Homer, and Hap are at in this field garden by the asylum. But, you know, there's green screens and crappy sets, so everything, you know, he's basically looking down at this really surreal meta thing. The actress who is playing OA has hit her head, seriously concussed. She's fallen from being held at some some type wire. You can actually take off her blonde wig and underneath is a shorter one, her real hair. And in this world, she is Britt Marling, the actress, right? We're getting really meta. Wouldn't that be crazy if like Britt was like, actually a crazy person and she's been she's like i've been trying to tell my story forever or maybe she really is an angel who knows (laughs) no but it's just fun storytelling so it leads to her as an actress as Britt marling the person uh who plays oa and jason isaac the person who plays hap that's his name his accent even changes because he doesn't um i think he's like australian or something if i'm getting this wrong i'm sorry but he he's he can fake a very good american accent basically or british accent i think it is and in this world, he is married to her. So while they're watching this scene and he's looking down, they're kind of horrified by both OA, Kareem looking down that OA might potentially be dead. He's also horrified at the idea that potentially this is all some weird, surreal meta thing. Like, is this real? Is it not? What am I looking at? He looks and he sees Buck, the version of Buck, and he calls out. He calls to Michelle. He realizes the connection because he's seen her vegetable state. She hears him. She knows immediately. She knows she's in the wrong timeline. And she runs up this stage version of the house. She reaches through the window. And while she doesn't actually go through the window, we don't see her. Kareem just falls back and the window returns to a normal window. She does return to her body. Also in this timeline, when the ambulance is pulling away... Someone jumps in the car and kind of almost like a punk rock type look, and it's motherfucking Steven! Steven successfully made the jump all season. He was convinced he was somehow connected to OA. He was meant to follow her, and he didn't understand why he wasn't able to. And he successfully leaped. He jumped. He willed himself to her the way she willed herself to Homer, which is so beautiful. And I love when he's holding her hand. And he looks at Hap and he goes, hello, Hap. And you can see Hap is confused because he only knows him as a victim he poached from the house. He doesn't have any connection to him. And here he is this guy who knows who he is and gives him this expression of like, oh, I know. Like, I know not only your name, I know what you've done to OA face. So I'm very excited about what's going to happen there. I'll be honest, though, I'm a little concerned if we're going to have a whole season where she's in love with Hap and it's gross. I think I'll throw up if I see them together. And Homer's trying to convince her and she just won't believe it. That's the type of tiresome and anxiety-inducing plot line I cannot handle and will not enjoy. I mean, I couldn't even handle the first two episodes when Homer is... um, We see Homer and she's excited to see him, but he doesn't recognize her at all. And he works for Hap and Hap has control over her again. That sucked, but thankfully they saved it by only doing it for, like, maybe an episode and a half, and then uh, it just went some amazing places. So I have faith in Brit and Zal. They know how to tell great stories. I feel it will move forward for the best. But that being said, question time. There are so many questions I have. So is Homer, when Homer appeared in French's Mirror and Rachel appeared in Buck's, does that mean they are somehow siblings like OA and Kareem? Part of me wondered if there's like a sibling dynamic there that a lot of other um, angels experience, that you kind of have a proverbial partner. Because it is kind of crazy that the exact people she happened to choose also happened to be the same quote-unquote special people that he chose. Maybe they are angels as well, and they don't even know it. That's just, like, uh, something out there to think about. Because, like, I feel like Rachel chose Buck. And French, Homer chose French. That being said, I wondered if um, Rachel's trapped. I kind of wonder 
the scientific schematics to all this jazz because we even saw Rachel in a form of a spiritual coffin, but notice how Rachel and Homer were only able to show themselves in the mirror to their quote unquote partners, as I'm gonna dub it, when they were no longer in their body, but they were unable to move forward. I wonder if there's some sort of spiritual connection there that's aligned to help if there's any fuck ups in the jump. Like they're meant to help each other along the way and no one no one person can do it alone. Which is why Kareem and um, OA are connected. I know she romantically feels connected to Homer and in some weird spirit quest she's connected to Hap, but realistically when push came to shove and, and trying to solve un- unanswerable answers, if I'm saying that correctly, and uh, get out of Hap's grip, Kareem was the one that helped her, and that's so pivotal to moving forward in the journey. Uh, so I, I, it's just like kind of an idea I'm throwing around there. Uh, I also thought it was just like a side interesting note. I noticed Hap didn't fully understand what Ruskin was saying when Ruskin was talking about keeping Nina there. Oh, I forgot to mention this. Nina... Um, the reason why Kareem went to go see her and the reason why they got all connected was because Nina was the person who wrote the first book about the people that dreamt about dreaming about the prediction of World War II. So, in, by the way, fucking crazy, right? She actually was the one who came up with the whole idea of dreams. So in a weird way, she was aligned with Hap in another lifetime. They weren't together. Um, I don't think she saw him as that or really cared, but they were in a weird way partners and Ruskin was a part of that kind of like imprisonment. I don't think he was thinking we will imprison Nina because we want to do experiments on her. I think he was just aware of all of like Nina's supernatural abilities and the connections and the experiments they were working on. Going back to the whole happen away thing, it kind of makes you wonder if like we're just getting their relationship to be tortured or... Is there some bigger plot point where it is all connected and he isn't as evil? I mean, well, he is evil because he did those bad things, but maybe he has like a higher purpose than just being an antagonist that motivates her. Maybe they too are somehow spiritually connected to reach something that they need one another to reach that. Part of me even wonders if he is potentially an angel himself that maybe these moves can only be done by angels And he doesn't even know it yet because he's such a weenie. He has never had any near-death experiences unlike everybody else who has. Uh, I also wonder the idea of if you have to be an angel to travel or not when it comes to the experiments. Because when they were doing the experiments, one of those people was an angel who kind of got unfortunately tricked by Hap. Again, I don't know why you would ever want to do anything he says. But the others, we don't have proof that they're angels yet. Um, We do know that BBA can spiritually feel things in other dimensions, so that kind of almost feels like she is potentially either psychic or an angel. But the she wasn't there in the pool, I'm pretty sure. Everyone else was, which is why they couldn't jump or leap, which, which kind of gets answered because they were in a vegetable state in that world. And uh, it makes me wonder why Betty didn't jump because I kind of get the idea that the reason why Rachel was reaching out to BBA was not only for her psychic abilities, but because she was able to, uh, she, she wasn't, she wasn't trapped by Hap. She could potentially save everyone because she wasn't in the prison. That's kind of the vibe I got. But when those people went through the house, it kind of unlocks something in their minds. Like once you give them the information, you kind of hack the system, you give them the code that angels are naturally programmed with, something kind of sprouts out of their mind, an actual seed, a plant, a flower. I wonder, I mean, we get proof that angels do it too, but maybe anyone or anyone is capable of this as well. Or did he actually successfully lure angels and he didn't even know it? Either way, uh, it just makes you wonder about everyone else and what their role is, and they might not even know it. Um, I also thought it was interesting when it was mentioned very quickly, the idea of seven heavens. I said, are there seven heavens, and will um, OA eventually reach the top, and what will she do? Like, is there going to be seven seasons, and each season is a different heaven? But on the other hand, I don't think it works like that because the way that there's so many different interdimensional timelines, 
Part of me wonders if it's a cruel joke where they'll just forever travel or if the timelines are more of like, okay, we're going to talk about the fourth dimension for a second. Um, they might be spread out wide, but they're like on a flat plane. They're not moving up. And each journey you experience is like a form of moving up emotionally before you are fully complete. So there's almost like seven heavens within inside you. You have to complete this puzzle with inside you before you were able to kind of pull out of all the dimensions and go back up to that starry sky to that woman who was talking to her when she chose to go back down which by the way I wonder if she regrets that I mean I know she doesn't have like a full oh no wait she does have a memory of it she told she talked about it but I want to be like oh you probably regret it because that woman was like you're gonna you're gonna go through a lot of lifetimes a lot of pain it's gonna suck and you you could stay here I've got lemonade and cookies <laughs> Uh, so that just makes me wonder what will happen if Oe gets there, because part of me wonders if she even wants that. I don't think she wants all this torture, but she does feed and feed off of and love the adventure and the puzzle storytelling. I think she'd be happiest if she could go through these different lifetimes and just be with Homer, and they could travel together. Uh, that would probably be the best, instead of just fully moving on to enlightenment. And if she could be with the rest of her group, that would probably be the best, too. Um, but I don't know how much she would travel considering every time she travels, she keeps somehow popping up in a situation where she's trapped by Hap, this time through marriage, which is awful. I mentioned the messenger just a moment ago. The messenger said something kind of interesting that stood out to me. She said that she always sends her brother, and she was referring to the OA, I think. So it's weird because it makes you wonder the way she put it in past tense, if Oe has already been through this. There's some weird way to telescopically look down and see yourself going through the same pain over and over again. You've already been through it, and you can reach out and help yourself. Right? I know that seems kind of trippy, but like if we're talking about like interdimensional beings, isn't anything kind of possible? And it still fits within the realm of like time and how there's no linear way of like expressing it or we think time is linear but so many things are kind of happening at once and can happen again. I'm getting a little bit complicated and kind of fucking up what I'm trying to talk about but you get what I'm saying. I, I thought that was really interesting. I think it gave a little insight, just a little seed, a little pebble into the major storyline Brit and Zal are trying to break down. Um, honestly, it, 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 just that question, that one point she made alone of saying she always sends her brother. This has happened in the past. She sends her brother to go help her. It kind of brings up the idea of do they feel that, that this is predestined? So that's why she sends her brother, that everything's predestined. She knows she's going to go through this pain, so she'll protect, she'll send her brother to protect her. Or can her fate be changed? And she's maybe aware that something's going to happen, and she sends her brother in to thwart Hap's plans. And that being said, it just kind of makes you wonder who's looking out for OA. Like, is she looking out for herself, or is there a higher power? To be honest with you, the whole OA thing kind of is confusing to me, because when she goes up to that, we'll just call it heaven for now, that celestial space above everything, she is greeted as almost as if she's very old, but this seems like almost the first time she's going up there. But we know that in her lifetime, she's only technically so many years old. So when she lives lifetimes, has she lived multiple lifetimes, but within just this time period of like, I don't know, 1985 to 2019? Like, is that her timeline she's always hitting in? And she's just been going through it over and over again. And like, what is her specialness of being the original OA? Because while we've seen her now glow and fly, and that definitely sets her above everyone else, that definitely sets the curve, isn't everyone else able to travel? Why is she so special? Why does she need to go through this journey? And why, I mean, people even say like, the octopus even says he's honored by her. So she's somehow famous. But it kind of made me start to wonder if maybe OA at one time was existing in the celestial field and she chose to dive into it. She chose to be a part of it, but she was aware of the risks, but she needed to go through the journey. She wanted to, and she wanted to experience it. 
So she always sent her brother to protect her. She always knew what she was up against. Maybe he's always watching from the top photo lens, but now he's caught up in the, the river as well. I mean, they keep describing it as that, and that's kind of the perfect example when you think about how rapid a river can pull you into its current and you kind of forget who you are. Maybe she forgets who she is. But it's just, like, a question that's kind of out in the open that you don't find yourself asking. It also makes me think about this. Um, so there's this guy... His name's, I think it's Robert Monroe. He was a famous astral projector, which just basically means you are able to physically travel in your dreams. You're not able to touch anything, but people have said they've seen aliens, gone to other worlds, fly above their house. There's like a ton of different uh, things with that. And this guy went from like an ordinary business, you know, door-to-door -door salesman to leading an entire group funded by the government where they would astral project together. And at one point, he had a conversation with a being, and the being explained his that he lost his friend, that for fun, this interdimensional being, it wasn't like an alien, it was like above an alien, this spiritual being for fun they like to go into different lives and experience it and when they come back out they return but they can choose to go back in if they didn't like their life maybe they'll try being a girl then they'll try being a boy they'll pop in different time periods but it's kind of said to be dangerous even for them because you can find yourself losing it and this is all a conversation he wrote down that he said he experienced and this interdimensional being explained that reincarnation isn't technically real but it can be if you want to choose to keep staying and like living in this continued lifespan. And his friend, who was just doing it for fun, it's like how they get their kicks, he actually ended up forgetting who he was and getting lost in the world. He couldn't even remember that he was a celestial being or anything. And he just kept living lifespan after lifespan after lifespan, which is kind of scary to think about. And it brings me back to the whole river metaphor. Another question I have is, now that we know Steve did successfully jump and he was able to jump right within the vicinity of OA, is it true? Is he connected to her? Like, is everyone connected to OA? Is there a limited amount of angels and she happens to know all of them? You know, or, or are these, like, her almost apostles and they are meant to be a part of her story and vice versa and affect each other in just the right succinct way? Uh, I kind of loved that because... I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I did love seeing Steve finally being proven right because all season he had to fight against seeing his friend die, trying the moves and not seeing his friend be brought back to life, having his faith crushed and kind of be rebu rebuttaled time and time again and to, to finally have it answered, finally watch him jump, finally see, have him see OA again to show that it was all real and that he was chosen and it was meant to be. It was a beautiful thing. I'm glad they gave us that little bone. I also kind of wondered if the stream in the house was another version of travel. The messenger talked about how there's different ways to travel. Now, she came up with a logical way of creating little machines that do the physical movements so they kind of stand in for the people that you would normally need to jump in with, to use to jump, so he doesn't need his group of people anymore. Um, it's so fucking sad. Renata's, Renata's the only one left. Homer's dead. Rachel's dead. Technically, the other guy's dead. So sad. Um, but he, he can use those machines. But what if... You could literally get in the river and go down it. I don't know how you would get out. It could be dangerous, like I said. But it was just an idea considering this stream, this river, abled this house to have the ability to see through it. It was like the house was the telescope. And I'm talking about electrical telescope now. And the stream was the battery. The technology that makes it possible to see so far in the stars. Because honestly, if you're like into any of this shit like I am, um, I have another podcast, Mystery Storytime Podcast, and we talk about ghost stuff and demon stuff and things like that, occult things. And we, all, we often find a lot of haunted houses, not everyone, obviously, it's not that super common, but a lot of infamous haunted houses tend to have a quote unquote demon portal where demons are coming from. And the way it's kind of expressed is it's not always just someone did some crazy ritual and opened something up they shouldn't have. 
a lot of the time it feels like it's almost an accidental tear in space. And I always put out the theory that, well, you know, space and time and everything across all the different planets is so big. I can't imagine it's perfect. I imagine it's going to have its little random holes. And why couldn't it be a random hole in someone's basement? And I wonder if this stream is a random little tear in this interdimensional travel for these spiritual beings. It's like an accident that plopped up that people ended up uh, either taking advantage of or being smart and taking care of it. And that's everything. Woo! Happy 100 episodes! I hope I did a good job explaining it. I tried my best. Honestly, even though the story is super complex, Brit and Zhao truly are master storytellers, and it's very comprehensible when you watch it. Uh, I'm definitely curious what you guys think theory-wise, but overall, guys, I can't believe I did 100 episodes. I fucking loved it, and I look forward to doing 100 more! So again, I might be starting a Patreon, I, I don't really know, but either way, please feel free to subscribe, like, oh, just tell a friend, spread the good word. I love you guys in the most platonic way possible. Bye!